Good morning. I'd like to start by taking a vote, although I can barely see the audience. How many of you have a disabled for a friend? Well, you corroborate what I'm going to be speaking on. While able-bodied India, with its 117 athletes, was able to barely scrape two medals, Devendra Jhajharya, Deepa Malik, Maria Panthangavelu, and Varun Singh Bhati, undaunted by adversity, scripted history, and made India proud at the very same venue. And did they get a loud enough applause? I'd like you to ponder on that. It is for this group of invisible, marginalized, unsung heroes that I'm privileged to work. There are over 1 billion people, which constitute about 15% of the world's population, that live with some form of disability. And amputees, that is people who have lost a limb, constitute a large segment. The number of amputees worldwide is rising at an alarming rate with ongoing wars, the continuing legacy of landmines long after conflicts are over, the increasing incidence of accidents, diabetes, and natural disasters. More than one million people around the world lose a limb every year which means a new amputee is added to this population every 30 seconds. 80% of the amputee population lives in the low and middle income countries. And the World Health Organization estimates this number to be over 30 million. Keeping pace with amputee needs, astounding research is going on in the field of prosthetics, which means artificial limbs. The latest generation being that of the thinking arm or the thinking leg, in which there are computer chips connected to sensors that pick up nerve signals and respond in real time directly to a patient's intentions. It's unbelievable. It's as close as it can get to science fiction. The prosthesis actually knows what you're thinking. Ironically, all this research is directed to the really affluent amputees. So an amputee, a child in the West, may end up being a blade runner or may even be a blade runner at the age of three, whereas an amputee in the low middle income country may still be hobbling on crutches. So, do you guys want to watch so all these designs that are being developed are prohibitively expensive and beyond the reach of people or amputees in the low and middle income countries. However, even if they were made available to amputees in the low and middle income countries by some well-meaning philanthropist, they would be ill-suited. As the demographics of low income countries creates a user profile that is vastly different from that in the high income countries. A typical amputee in the high-income countries would be a senior, would be over 60 years of age, would have lost the limb to vascular insufficiency with or without diabetes, would have multiple associated medical dysfunctions resulting in restricted mobility and a short lifespan. In contrast, an amputee in India or rest of the developing world is a young, healthy man, generally under 30 years of age, who unfortunately met with an accident and lost a limb. He has no associated medical disorder pulling him down and has his whole productive life ahead of him. So clearly, the same solutions cannot work for two such dissimilar groups. The socio-cultural, the religious, and environmental needs of our people are also very different. Amputees in our part of the world mostly come from a rural background. They are farmers by profession, live in a warm climate, use the floor as a work surface, are required to negotiate rugged terrain, 
and they may or may not wear shoes depending on where they are or what they are doing. Amputees in the West, on the other hand, live in a cold climate. They walk on level surfaces, sit on chairs, and always wear shoes. Now, in retrospect, it might seem clear that these are two really diverse, dis distinctly very different groups. But when the prosthetic center in Jaipur was started, it started on the premise that the single most important challenge that prevents amputees in India from getting a prosthesis is cost. So they set about making inexpensive replicas of what was being used in England at that point of time. You see, the colonial mindset was right there and working over time. So very enthusiastically, amputees from in and around Jaipur were provided these limbs. Providentially, the enthusiasm and the sense of achievement was short-lived. 90% amputees rejected these limbs. Their feedback was a revelation. When asked, they said that the artificial limb that was given to them didn't look like a human limb. And so it had to be concealed in a shoe. But with a shoe, they couldn't go, go and work in their fields. Nor could they enter a temple or a mosque. In fact, some people could not even enter their homes or kitchens with an artificial limb with a shoe on. The artificial limb was also rigid. It lacked mobility. So people couldn't sit on the floor or squat. Now, these are postures that are an essential part of our social etiquette and even more so in rural society. Because it lacked mobility, it also made ambulation on rugged terrain very uncomfortable for patients. Now you see, these were limbs that were designed for people in England. They had a very different lifestyle, environment. And so what worked very well in England was a disaster in India. And as is very rightly said, there is no innovation without failure. And this failure or rejection of our designs by the amputees is what triggered the innovation of the Jaipur technology. The team that set about uh, designing the Jaipur technology was remarkable. It comprised of doctors, orthopedic surgeons, with no background or formal training in prosthetics, or biomechanics, or material science. They worked with the local craftsmen who were equipped with rustic primitive tools. And all the material know-how and the material came from the roadside tire retreading shops. So this was an exceptional group. This group worked very closely with these amputees who had rejected the artificial limbs. And listed out or formulated requirements for a prosthesis and worked on it. In fact, the design and technology is still evolving. But as it stands, that's the Jaipur foot that looks lifelike. It looks like a human foot. That's the entire limb. That's a replica of the human leg. And it permits all that the patients needed and even goes a little beyond. So people can sit on the floor, squat, climb trees, which is not really essential. I mean, how many of us climb trees or jump off trees? In the religious context, when I said people can't enter temples or go to mosques, this is what I meant. You see, the foot is its a universal limb. And the limits are set by the patient, not by the design. In fact, what it taught us was that prosthetic design is not merely technological concerns about replacing a lost body part. And that the social, cultural, religious, environmental, and other needs of patients could not be ignored. So whenever you're designing something, you're designing it for somebody, and you cannot ignore that somebody. 
Now, for patients who'd lost the limb from below the knee, we'd more or less gotten our act together. But for people who'd lost the limb from above the knee, we were struggling. We were struggling to provide an efficient knee joint. And loss of the knee profoundly undermines performance. So much so that if a person has lost one limb from above the knee, in terms of speed of walking and energy consumption, he is worse off than somebody who's lost both the legs from below the knee. So traditionally, people who'd lost their limbs from above the knee were provided a single axis knee joint, which is something like a door hinge with a lock. So these people walked with a straight knee. And uh, the pattern of walking was uh, ergonomically inefficient and cosmetically awkward. In 2007, we started a collaborative research initiative with Stanford University with the objective of designing a high-performance, affordable prosthetic knee joint for low-resource settings. We chose the polycentric concept, which is a very versatile concept and closely mimics the human knee. The first prototype was ready in 2008, and we immediately set off with field trials, having learned from our mentors that the single determinant of acceptance or abandonment of a design was the user's verdict. We were fortunate that we got very encouraging response from the users, although we did have our fair, a fair share of failure and user concerns, and the design is again still evolving. In 2009, the Time magazine hailed the Jaipur Ni as one of the 50 best inventions of the world for that year. And this really, and this really gave us a boost. In 2013, we got the Indo-US Science and Technology Grant for Healthcare, and we were able to address our issues of failure, user concerns, and upgrade the knee. And that's the latest version. We did that in partnership with DREV, a not-for-profit product development company based in San Francisco. They transformed the Jaipur knee and upgraded it to a level that it conformed to international standards of the ISO 10328. In fact, the Jaipur knee was launched in the US in 2015 December as the remotion knee. Incidentally, we get mentioned now when people are talking about think globally, act locally. Although we were, I must admit, it was not our objective. We were thinking locally, acting globally, quite the reverse. But we were able to upgrade it to an international level and it was launched in the US before it was launched in India. It was launched in India in 2016, February. Now, although all this work was done to meet the needs of Indian amputees, the distinctive, unique needs of Indian amputees, but the design that developed had features that had universal application. So this wave of matching technology to people has now spread across the developing world. And the Jaipur technology is being used currently in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Lebanon, Liberia, Fiji, Colombia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, uh, and a few more countries. Now, the World Health Organization, in its latest report on disability gives us these really sad statistics that only 5 to 15 percent of people who need prosthetic services have access to them in the low and middle income countries. Now, if people don't have access to prosthetics, they're also stripped of their basic rights of access to food, shelter, education, health care, and their participation in society. And although 
at the Jaipur Foot Organization, our objective is to re-mobilize patients, restore their mobility. But the impact of the prosthesis goes way beyond just restoring their mobility. Because by doing that, in a social context, we are enabling them in a disabling environment. And in an economic viewpoint, the foot serves as a poverty alleviator. A disability is not merely a health issue. It reflects the interaction of a person's bodily loss with the society that he lives in. Disability is not a choice, but discrimination is. And the way a society treats its disabled is a true measure of how civilized it is. My talk is not to pull at your heartstrings, to touch a cord, to make you see the plight of my patients, both physical and emotional, to be sensitized to their exclusion. But the purpose of my talk is to motivate you, to draw from their strength, to be inspired by them. Because their lives are not about suffering, they are about overcoming and embracing adversity. And if they can live a life without limits, what's your excuse? Whatever it is, it's invalid. Thank you.